Ladies and gentlemen, may I now request our uh, distinguished guests here on the dais to kindly release the conference abstract. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to have Professor C.R. Vishweshwara Rao, former Vice Chancellor Vikrama Simhapur University, with us today. Besides being an accomplished administrator, Professor Rao has more than 40 years of experience in teaching and research and literature. He has authored and edited many books and written and published numerous articles in various reputed scholarly journals. Professor Rao has held important administrative and academic positions throughout his long career. He's been honored with Best Teachers Award in 2005, Ananta Lakshmi Kanta Sahiti Puraskaram in 2009, and Excellence in Education Award from Tana and Tante Dallas, America, to name only a few. Professor Rao will be delivering today's inaugural address on literature and society, theoretic perceptions, and cross illuminations. Professor Rao. Professor Panchanan Mohanty, Professor Nasiruddin Fariz, Professor Shagun Shagufta, Professor Govindaya Godavarti, Professor Amin Ansari, Professor Hasibuddin Khadri, distinguished participants, invitees. Uh, it gives me very great pleasure to know that this university, which was started in the year 1998, has made very good progress. And I'm sure this progress will be kept up by all of you, the younger generation, so that the, the flag of the university system should be kept flying and flying high. I am extremely happy that Professor Mohanty has given a very uh, down-to-earth, earthy kind of address in which he has raised issues relating to the mother tongue and the other tongue with his tongue in English chains. Uh, in fact, the, the, the heroine of the Ramayana, Sita, reminds me of a Latin expression, Sita, P-S-Y-C-H-E. Nagate, it's all in a put in them. And therefore, Sita becomes Sita. This is the kind of interrelationships among languages. Some time ago, one of the linguisticians expressed fears over the future of the English language. What with the, what with the SMS culture, the tweeting of messages, and the consequent shrinking of language. Does the language shrink? Keats said about Milton, our language shrunk under him. Such a thing, is it going to happen in the case of the English language? But then let us remember that in the context of globalization and deterritorialization, English is also absorbing lots and lots from a variety of other languages. 
And as long as this absorption phenomenon goes on, the death of the language probably doesn't occur. And therefore, we believe that foreign borrowings into any language are milestones for the growth of that language. Now I will come to my lecture, wherein I will be speaking about certain theoretical perceptions relating to literature and its relationship with society. And then the kind of cross illuminations between literature and society. The first thing that I would refer to is Aristophanes of 446 BC, the fourth century author who was known for his Aristophanic melodrama. I would make a specific reference to his play, The Frogs, which speaks about, which speaks in the context of the death of the tragic poet Euripides. Euripides died just the previous year. And Aristophanes was expressing his despair at the stage of the decline of tragedy. This play was a response to that. And a melodrama that this play is, it contains all kinds of uh, uh, weird dramatic techniques. There is a pair of scales in which dramatists are weighed in terms of the weight of their poetry, and so on and so forth. But then, what is the play essentially about? The play is, as we find out towards the end, a search for a poet to be brought back from Hades, brought back into the earth, in order to inspire humanity. During that period, Athens was at war with Sparta. And then a sense of heroism, a sense of values needed to be infused into men. Literature and values were in a way integrally related. Literature was considered an instrument of social amelioration. It was an instrument of cultural rehabilitation. This is an idea that as late as in the 20th century, T.S. Eliot spoke about. There is a kinship between literature and society. Decline in literature meant a consequent decline in moral and aesthetic and heroic values. It was this idea that this play, Frogs, by Aristophanes, dramatizes. Milton, the poet, expressed a similar, uh, a, a similar fear when he said, that his concern was with producing a heroic poem. And his doubt was whether he could produce a heroic poem in an age which was declining in terms of values, in a civilization which was coming to an end, which was believed in the 17th century on the basis of certain biblical forecasting biblical doomsday forecasting that the year 2000 was going to mean the end of the world. And the 17th century was considered to be a late age. And therefore, could he bring out a poem worth its salt, which would be remembered by posterity? <clears throat> and in this process, Milton weighs several possibilities weighs the achievement of his predecessors and says, nor skilled nor studious, higher argument remains, sufficient of itself to raise that name, unless an age too late, or cold climate, or years damp my intended wing. This is how he goes about saying, in a sense, that the decline of society, the aging world, and the aging quality of literature are, in a sense, interconnected. 
these remind us of Matthew Arnold's view about the relationship between poetry and society. Mind you, in the essay, The Function of Criticism, at the present time, Matthew Arnold points out that, that the values that society generates and poetry are integrally related. If values are properly generated in society, they are seeped in by poetry. And therefore, it is possible that poetry of a higher order is produced. The idea, according to Matthew Arnold, is that poetry seeps in ideas from society. And that societal degeneration leads to devitalized poetry. Poetry is at bottom a criticism of life, Arnold once again points out. And poetry and criticism, poetry and the social order are seen to be complementary to each other. Now I once again go back to Plato and to his Republic. Plato's contention was that poetry unregulated by philosophy is dangerous to the soul and to the community. Plato holds that poetry inspires undesirable emotions in society and should therefore be censored. But at the same time, Plato, in one of his essays, expresses great admiration for Homer because Homer's poetry contains a lot of popular culture engrafted in it. And thus he is able to see the integral relationship between popular culture and literature. Aristotle disagrees with Plato that poetry is a corrupted form of representation. He sees representation as an effective method of teaching. He proposes the humanistic alternative and the humanistic alternative is that one turns to work of literature for insights into human life, not for authoritative knowledge about ultimate reality. What literature provides is insight into human life. The humanistic critic thus begins with the literary work, not with the political or philosophical views that are embedded in a work of art. Now, uh, you have, of course, in the, in, the, in the history of discussion on literature and its relationship with philosophy and its relationship with ethics, a number of writers like Sidney, like Shelley, all these expressing their views. I, I wouldn't uh, touch them. Uh, I, I, would, I would once again take you, take you forward from Aristotle and Plato to the 19th century to Matthew Arnold who says poetry consoles us, enables us, uh, uh, sorry, ennobles us and refines us. This is what he says in his study of poetry. Remember the social context for this kind of an utterance of Matthew Arnold. He was speaking in the context of Victorian skepticism, the Victorian dilemma, as you would call it, the Victorian frame of mind, as one of those great critics of the 19th century thought, uh, Houghton described it. What is, what is the function of literature? Dr. Johnson in the 18th century said, just representations of general nature. What is nature according to him? Nature according to Dr. Johnson, nature from the perspective of the 18th century was a human nature. And what was literature supposed to do? Give a just representation of general human nature. It is in this context that you have Edison and Steele producing the spectator papers and these spectators papers reveal to you the coffee house culture of the period. 
the coffee houses, the discussions that were going on, the growing middle classes, the rising middle classes and their acquaintance with writing, and therefore the rise of the periodical essay during that period. The enlarged middle class reading people gave scope for an Edison and Steele to speak about social amelioration through a pointed projection of the men, the, 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 the morals and manners of people. Take for example, some of you who must have passed through your universities in the recent years must be acquainted with these works. Ian Jacques, The Augustan Satire. It, it is one of the examination musts which you must have read. And if you go through Ian Jacques' Augustan satire, it presents, it, it, it offers a critique of the allegorical mode of poetry. You have Dryden's Absalom and Achitophel discussed here. There is a discussion of Pope's epistle to Augustus, epistle to Dr. Arbuthnot, Pope's The Rape of the Lock, and so on. What do these point out? What does this device of the allegorical mode place before society? They place before society not only poets and poetasters at whom Pope frowned a great deal, they also place before us the contemporary social morality. The trivializing of the heroic, that was one predominant trait which through the rape of the lock we come to know about the 18th century. This is what F.R. Lewis says in his sociology and literature. This is a very important essay where Lewis points out that Chaucer needs to be appreciated for the contribution he made to the development of the English language. Why? Because, Lewis points out, Chaucer held fast by the communal and social standards of the society, which was important for literary speech. His speech, Lewis points out, was taken out of, taken alive out of the daily speech, the daily concourse of men and morals. Lewis's contention, contention is that no attempt to relate literary studies with sociology will yield profit unless informed by, of course, a first-hand concern with literature. That's the reason why I said my topic would be cross-illuminations between literature and society. A real interest, a real literary interest, Lewis points out, is interest in man, interest in society, interest in civilization. It is this living critical inwardness with literature which Lewis wants the reader to cultivate. The kind of speech that a Chaucer drew was the living, uh, drew from was the living speech of the contemporary society. It is in this context that Lewis contributed in his own way to the dislodgement of Milton from his rightful place in the poetic firmament. Because he said, Milton's speech in the poem Paradise Lost was not intrinsic to the nature of the English language. He crafted into the poem Paradise Lost a kind of language which was Homeric, which was Virgilian, which was Biblical, which was Tassovian, and so on and so forth. Lewis weighs in this essay 
sociology and literature, Trevelyan's social history of England, especially England under the stewards by G. M. Trevelyan, the great social historian. And he says that understanding of literature is indeed gained by a knowledge of social history. But then the knowledge of social history and literature cannot be taken as synonyms. He was aware of the interconnectedness of culture, literature, and language in society. It is this symbiosis, it is this interanimation, to use a Bakhtinian word, which is very important in order to understand the relationship between literature and society from the point of view of Levis. Now, I, I will go to uh, something else from this. <laughs> Let us take Elizabethan literature into consideration. I will mention only such of those examples with which readers are familiar, with which students of literature are familiar. Let us take Elizabethan literature and the relationship this literature has with popular culture. Elizabethan popular superstition. Let us look at how this was employed in literature, especially by Milton. Take, for example, Paradise Lost, Book 9. Milton is known for his long-tailed or Homeric similes, as we call them. And these long-tailed similes go beyond the point of comparison and build in into the poem a lot of Milton's encyclopedic learning, not only his encyclopedic learning, but also his ideas on Elizabethan culture, Elizabethan popular superstition, and so on. Let us take this particular simile where the elusiveness of Satan is compared to the elusiveness of the wandering fire, wandering funeral pyre, as we call it as when a wandering fire, compact of unctuous vapor, which the night condenses and the cold environs round, kindled through agitation to a flame, which oft they say some evil spirit attends, evil spirits associated with funeral pyres, hovering and blazing with delusive light, it moves around from place to place. It deludes you. Likewise, it deluded Satan's rhetoric, deluded the amazed night wanderer as it was, as it were, that he was. Misleads the amazed night wanderer. Also, let us take into consideration the Elizabethan lore Milton employs in the poem, where he refers to the, the, the hugeness of the dimensions of Satan and things of Galileo and his telescope, the Tuscan artist, the Tuscan artist, and there is yet another comparison in the poem Paradise Lost where Satan, in the hugeness of his dimensions, is compared to a fleet of ships. What exactly is the significance of this fleet of ships image? Let us remember that the Elizabethan age was an age of irresistible travel. It was an age of travel it was an age of uh, it was an age when people were very familiar with richard hecluet's voyages samuel pepys diaries about um, a, a variety of uh, travel impressions all this is incorporated in the poem 
paradise lost. So much so that in spite of its being Homeric, Virgilian, Biblical and so on and so forth, it is very deeply rooted in the Elizabethan culture, in the Elizabethan times, shares of the Elizabethan zeitgeist. This is what exactly M.C. Bradbrook points out in her English dramatic form about the art of Shakespeare. When you examine the English dramatic form, you would notice how deeply indebted Shakespeare was to Elizabethan popular superstition, Elizabethan lore, Elizabethan customs. Look at, look at the way the new historicists have been digging into details of Shakespeare's works and trying to compare them with Elizabethan historiography. And in today's newspapers carries an account of a concubine for Shakespeare and a child born out of that illicit relationship. Now, let us once again, I am, because the time given for me is half an hour, 45 minutes, and therefore I am in a hurry to cover as much as possible within the limited space I have. Let us take, for example, a novel like, uh, a novelist like Dickens. The novels of Dickens speak about this influence, counter-influence phenomenon. They had, it, they had an indirect influence on creating in society, in the Victorian society, a feeling for regulating and removing the social wrongs of the day. A crying need for, need for reform was what he built into the texture of his novels. The chartist agitations, the poor laws, the knowledge of all these we get from Hardy's novels, sorry, um, Dickens's novels. Take his novel, Hard Times, which is a critique of utilitarian philosophical systems, which is a critique of what the utilitarian philosophical system brought about as a consequence of its philosophical evolutions into humanity, extreme self-interest engendered by the capitalist concerns. And so one of the pleas that Dickens seems to be making in his novels is, capitalists ought to be kind. He doesn't propose a solution to the problems that, in a sense, capitalists ought to be kind and workers ought not to be rebellious. In the 20th century, T.S. Eliot told us that It's not the business of a poet to teach. His business is to present. The progress of an artist is, he said, a continual extinction of personality. The more perfect the artist, the more separate in him is, he said, the man who suffers and the mind which creates. You are familiar with all these things. He was speaking about depersonalization. And in the context of depersonalization, he was making a mention of the, the finely filiated platinum image. As you would remember in the essay, which essay is it? Tradition and the individual talent. As an antithesis of this, you have the Marxist argument, which points out that art is weapon. The Marxist theological, uh, the theoretical formulations point out to us further that art is something which attenuates reality 
rather than highlights reality. Marxist aesthetic theory sees the work of art as a product, directly or indirectly, of the base structure of society. And art would indeed contribute only to the diminishing, the attenuation of actuality. Terry Eagleton, in his essay, Culture and Ideology, asserts that a literary text is not an expression of ideology, but it is the very production of ideology. Please take note of the difference between expression and production. What a vast difference these two terms make. He examines the question of the place of literature in the scheme of the dialectical materialism of Marx. Now, examining this question, you have Edmund Wilson in an essay, Marxism and Literature, who points out that art cannot be considered to be a weapon of social or economic or political propaganda or amelioration. Edmund Wilson points out one more thing. He says that literature cannot be produced to order. That is where the Soviet writers failed at one stage. Art, if it is produced to order, if it is commissioned by the state, would only be a mere instrument of state policy, a weapon of propaganda, and no more than that. Examining this question, Edmund Wilson points out the achievement of a novel li novelist like Dickens. Dickens is a writer with a Shakespearean fecundity of ability of characterization. He was a great favorite of, the, of, of Russia under the Tsars and the Soviets both. He was found congenial in China. The kind of literature he produced agreed with the thought of Mao in the intensity of imaginative power, the power of evoking visible objects. He had no rival except Balzac and Shakespeare. Tolstoy admired him greatly. And of course, he had his own method of presenting social reality. That which was not susceptible to exaggeration, Dickens could not produce. Exaggeration was the method by means of which he placed before us the social reality of the day. That which is not amenable to fantastic treatment, Dickens was not capable of producing in a way. And therefore, if you take his novels like um, Bleak House, for example, or Oliver Twist, the slums in England, the poor laws of England, the legal system of England, the corrupt legal practices of society, all these were brought out with trenchant irony, with an element of fantasy and exaggeration and the element of the macabre built into his narratives. Let us come closer to the Indian context and let us take into consideration Mulkraj Anand, who but Mulkraj Anand speaks through his characters. He seems to speak through every one of his characters, unlike Shakespeare. In the case of Shakespeare, Shakespeare virtually traveled on the viewless wing of poesy. Shakespeare was capable of such empathy that he identified himself with every one of the characters. What was Shakespeare? What was Shakespeare's philosophy? 
no one could decipher from his place. Whereas in the case of Mulkaraj Anand, his expression of anger and inhumanity and vehement protest against what he called a certain kind of apartheidness against the social classes. This needs to be taken into account in the context of the Indian social order. The ferocity of his phrase is something which communicates instantly to the reader the message he wants to convey. The segregation of the individuals on the ground of social inequality was something that was not compatible with the idea of an egalitarian society and this is the idea which, which Mulkaraj Anand brings out consistently in his novels. And that is what is projected very successfully in some of the Dalit autobiographies of the day. Now, We have, we have so far seen literature, the kind of society that produced literature, the relationship between the poet and the work, and how we could see a certain kind of cross-illumination between these two. Now we will introduce a third feature also into the narrative by making use of the new historicist approaches and Richard Hogarth's ideas of what is meant by cultural studies. Richard Hogarth, in his The Uses of Literacy, which is one of the most cited works, speaks about the loss of an authentic popular culture. He speaks about the imposition of a mass culture on humanity. It is against this context that he is speaking. When we take a work of literature into consideration, the old historians like E.M.W. Tilliard, whose work, The Elizabethan World Picture, is a well-known work, or Shakespeare's history plays, these old historians believed in the progressive nature of history, in the perfectibility of man, and assumed that literary texts were transcendental expressions of a stable and ordered world of values. This was a deterministic view that went unchallenged for certain centuries. Now when we come to new historicism, which is not historical but which is historicist, Its interest is in history as text. It believes in subjectivity shaping culture and social formation and individual identity and subjectivity influencing all these. And new historicism centers upon one important idea, the textuality of history and the historicity of the text. And it points out, unlike Clay and Brooks's The Heresy of Paraphrase, or unlike um, you know, William Wimsett's The Intentional Fallacy, this is a, this is a departure from the, the new critical tenets. It points out, it presents the very antithesis of what the new criticism points out. What does the new criticism say? To say it very simply, it says in the words of Prince Hamlet, the play is the thing wherein I will catch the conscience of the king. What matters to me is the literary text, which is an auto telos, which is a telos world, which is a world by itself. Unlike the new criticism, 
the new historicism views literary texts and their parallel non-literary texts and world as interrogating, contradicting, modifying one another. Take, for example, Stephen Greenblatt and his interpretation of Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. Stephen Greenblatt points out that Shakespeare here in this play displays knowledge of a certain kind of colonization. He points out that Shakespeare was aware of or showed deep knowledge of the, the original colonization of Virginia. This is a knowledge that was not evidently available to the general reading public until the play was produced. And thus Greenblatt suggests that Shakespeare had a somewhat privileged access to cultural, historical materials of his time. Eliot points out something to us about Shakespeare's knowledge of the world and history. Where did Shakespeare acquire all his knowledge of history from? He says, not from not many sources, Shakespeare knew little Greek and less Latin. Of course, this is an idea contested by Frank Kermode. All Shakespeare's knowledge of history was from Plutarch's knowledge of uh, Plutarch's uh, lives. Not even entirely or exactly from Plutarch's lives, but from North's translation of Plutarch's lives. And then Holland Shed's chronicles. These were the materials from which he produced his plays. And, and against this context, we'll, we'll really find it fascinating to read some of the new historicist accounts of Shakespeare. For example, one way to see the Tempest is as a text that negotiates between Renaissance society's growing role as a colonialist nation. The play also takes into consideration the dissenting voices against this colonial idea. It is Frank Kermode who points out to us that uh, one important essay of very significant, um, of great significance in analyzing Shakespeare's Tempest is Montaigne's of Cannibals. This was one of the important sources of Shakespeare's The Tempest, he points out. <coughs> the new critics therefore argue that literary texts are embedded within their cultural historical context. That is, they are not only produced by their historical moment, but they contribute to a certain kind of ideological production. For example, the tempest has given rise to the ideological production regarding the discourse on colonialism a colonialism that facilitated British imperialism. New historicism also points out in yet another direction. One, the relationship of text with history. Two, the relationship of the author with history and the text. And third, the third dimension that it brings in is the relationship of the critic. The critic's response to a work is also influenced by his environment, his beliefs, and his prejudices. And from out of these prejudices and, 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 and convictions and beliefs and environment of the critic would come an analysis which is profoundly analytical, profoundly illuminating, of a work of literature. Take, for example, Dickens's novel, Great Expectations. 
how we viewed it when we were students in the 60s and the 70s, and how in the post-Edward Saidian world, we are looking at it from the point of view of colonialism. When once the contemporary colonial paradigm is thought of in an analysis of a work like this, a profound rereading of Dickens would begin to unfold itself. So also let us take into consideration yet another thing, Edward Said's own analysis of, uh, of V.S. Naipaul. He says about V.S. Naipaul, V.S. Naipaul's area of darkness. At one point of time, we greatly admired because we still possessed that imperialist frame of mind. We were part of that imperial design. The empire strikes back. It continues to strike back. Said said, Naipaul found himself in the role of a prosecutionist for the imperial design in this work. It is these profound contemporary readers' interpretations of a text which see the text out of the historical context, but which nevertheless place the text from in, in a readerly background that needs to be taken into account. Uh, and it is against this context that interpretations of the Tempest, interpretations of Mrs. Dalloway, interpretations of the Merchant of Venice, was Shakespeare anti-Semitic? We would raise that question in the context of anti-Semitism. That has been much discussed in the 20th century and afterwards. And so also in the case of Mrs. Dalloway, there are examples of a, a variety of paths to take in relation to Mrs. Dalloway. What, what, what we read, when we read as students, was life is not a series of jig lamps symmetrically arranged. And we spoke about the asymmetry of the novel. But then, when you come to the, the new historicists and their reading of a novel like Mrs. Dalloway, they would take into account a variety of historical documents like doctor's records, medical journals of shell-shocked patients in conjunction with Virginia Woolf's characterization of the character Septimus Smith. In order to get a better understanding of World War soldiers, World War I soldiers who returned from the war in a shell-shocked condition. A comparison, rather of a sociological document and a literary work. Is, is, it, is, is it 40 minutes? OK, OK. So uh, and, and, and finally, and, and finally, I would make a reference to the, the post uh, uh, colonial writing, where the idea of ethnology is an important idea, where the idea of ethnology articulates contemporary social organization. Take, for example, Ngugi's The Trial of Didan Kimati. Uh, Edward Said, Said observes that the power to narrate or block other narratives from forming and emerging is very important to culture and imperialism and constitutes one of the main connections between the two. If you take the trial of Didan Kimati, it's a palimpsest which reveals a certain kind of intramural strength. And this intramural strength reveals to us dramatic traditions, theatrical, con theatrical conventions, cultural inscriptions, that carry 
Afrocentrism and also Eurocentrism. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is this kind of a doubleness of perspective, a cultural amphibianism, as Sayyid describes it, in the post-colonial society, where cultural amphibians, it is this kind of an am cultural amphibianism that contemporary texts reveal. And, and in that kind of a revelation of a contemporary society through literature, and the reflection of that society in literature, we derive a lot of uh, uh, source of strength, because every text thus becomes an intertext, replete with echoes of Eurocentrism and Afrocentrism as Indiacentrism, echoes, borrowings, juxtapositions, and so on and so forth. And in a way, it looks as though every text reveals to us how it is a piece of literary carpentry, showing a series of texts of the past and cultures of the present and the past, societies of the present and the past incorporated in that piece of writing. So thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak, for giving me this opportunity to interact with the participants and visit this institution which has acquired a good distinction within a very short span of time. Thank you.